I love astrophysics too, but you don't quite get that satisfaction. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? I'll wait a second. So welcome, everybody. This is a special department lecture organized by our department, the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. Generally, our department lectures, uh, in our department lectures, we try to invite speakers from other institutions just to see what happens in the rest of the world. But on this particular occasion, that's why I call this a special department lectures, we invited one of our own, Rick Binzel, because of all the press and the attention that his mission to Pluto has gotten recently. And we wanted to hear some of the science, not just look at the pictures. So Rick Binzel is a professor in our department, in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, and he also holds a joint appointment with AeroAstro. And he's a very accomplished planetary scientist and a professor uh, in both departments. I'll just mention a few of the awards that he obtained just to convince you that indeed he has contributed fundamental ideas to astronomy, and then I'll pass to the more interesting aspects of his life afterwards. So in 1990, he was the first recipient of the Apker Award by the American Physical Society. In 1990, he was awarded a URI Prize from the American Astronomical Society. He was also awarded by MIT, the McVicker Faculty Fellow for uh, Outstanding Teaching. But as I said, he's much more than that. Personally, uh, I'm very proud that he is, uh, I guess he instituted or he invented the Torino scale. The Torino scale is a scale that is used for characterizing the impact hazards associated with comets and asteroids. The reason why I say I'm very proud is named after Torino, which is the city in Italy where I was born, <laughs> because the scale was set up in a meeting in Torino. That's probably, apart from the Olympics, is the only other reason why Torino is worldwide known. So it's <laughs> He is also well known for his work on Pluto. He's been lobbying very hardly on retaining Pluto's status as a planet. We'll hear probably about that later in the talk. Uh, he lost that battle, but he won a much more important one, which is as a copy eye of the New Horizon mission. He got us to get the first glimpse of uh, Pluto and uh, the heart of Pluto. And today he's going to tell us something about the science that the mission has already delivered. And welcome. Thank you. Well, it's really great to see so many friends and colleagues and to, and to be able to share the Pluto story. And the most important thing I can tell you to start is that um, I'm just one of the team that's uh, done all this work to get ourselves to Pluto. So this really is a team effort. So uh, let me stop that. Oops. And uh, so just to keep track of the team. All right. So I'm going to, in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, tell you about discovering Pluto, but that's not just finding that Pluto is there. It's actually how did we find out what Pluto is and why we wanted to go there. Our journey to the launch pad was not easy, and I'll tell you a little bit about our trials and tribulations. The long voyage to Pluto after launch, the fact that we revealed what Pluto is after nine and a half years of flight, and what's the path ahead for the New Horizons mission. All right, so you've heard a little bit about Pluto. Uh, Pluto is far away, it's faint, it's dim, it's hard to study, and so there's sort of this mystique around Pluto. And you may have heard that we now call Pluto a dwarf planet. And I've got news for you, the sun has always been classified as a, stop that, has always, the sun has always been classified as a dwarf star, and so we love the sun, we love Pluto. And, <laughs> And maybe most importantly, there's nothing about what I'm going to say about Pluto or the science of Pluto that, for which the label matters at all. All right, so here's a lesson for the students. The reason we went to Pluto, uh, I might have to uh, abandon my clicker. The reason we went to Pluto wasn't just because we had never been there before. The reason we went to Pluto is because we had compelling scientific reasons. So for example, Pluto was discovered, the Kuiper belt was discovered through surveys. And once we've discovered something, we begin to make physical measurements. And as the measurements continue, we find out really interesting things, tantalizing properties. And we ask new questions, we try to resolve those questions. But ultimately, we reach a limit, a cap. 
and I call this the pyramid of planetary science, but there's many analogies in other fields. Perhaps particle physics, you ultimately get to the point where you need a major expenditure like a large hadron collider. Or in astronomy, you need a giant Magellan telescope. And in the case of Pluto, we had basically reached the limit of our ability to study Pluto from the Earth. We had all these questions we didn't understand. I'm going to try to illuminate those. But ultimately, that's the rationale where you make that big jump in expenditure and effort and go to a spacecraft. So uh, again, this is, has parallels in many fields, but this is sort of how it uh, builds itself in planetary science. All right, so Pluto was discovered in 1930 by a man named Clyde Tombaugh, born in Illinois. Born in Illinois, uh, raised in Kansas, moved to Arizona to conduct this survey to look for a planet out beyond Neptune. This involved taking glass plates of the sky uh, several nights apart and then comparing those glass plates with something called a blink comparator. Very tedious, very difficult process. But in February of 1930, he looked at a couple of plates from the previous month and found something moving across the sky with just the right rate to be in the outer solar system. And that was the discovery of Pluto. I met uh, Clyde Tombaugh in the 1980s as one of the few graduate students on the planet studying Pluto. You get to meet the discoverer. And I'm the guy on the right. And, um, <laughs> And Clyde has gotten to explore Pluto firsthand because some portion of his ashes are actually on board the New Horizons spacecraft. All right, so Pluto was discovered in 1930. As I said, it's far away, it's faint, it's hard to study. When you look at something through a telescope from the Earth, the uh, seeing, the atmosphere, the blurring effects of the atmosphere uh, make it very difficult to unravel what the characteristics are. And, um, but if you have specialized telescopes on specialized circumstances, um, you can sometimes see more detail. And this is an image from 1978 that was analyzed by an astronomer named Jim Christie, where this, the conditions were exceptional. And he noticed a little bump on the side of Pluto. And he went back through the archives and found many images of Pluto with this little bump on the side that would move around every 6.4 days, which happens to be the rotation period of Pluto. And the idea was that this was a large satellite of Pluto named Charon. And uh, so this was the discovery of uh, uh, Pluto's satellite in 1978. Now, it turns out before Europe in was invented, I was a Europe, a summer Europe, at the US Naval Observatory, literally in the office next door to where Charon was discovered. And as the, the, the kid who was the grunt work um, person, they gave me all these old dates and plates and said, does it really fit a 6.4 day period? So I got to do a little bit of the calculations that helped confirm there's this, this was a satellite. All right, so we discover a satellite. What's great about a satellite is, and maybe it's immediately obvious, is that, that uh, Kepler's third law enables you to determine the mass of the system. And we use this in exoplanets uh, research all the time. When Pluto was discovered, we didn't know if it was one Earth mass, 10 Earth masses. We really had no idea what the mass of Pluto was. Discovering the satellite let us pin down the mass. And it's small. It's a 500th of that of the Earth. But with this large satellite, one of the things we realized is that uh, with the satellite roughly half the size of Pluto, uh, the center of mass in the system is actually located outside the primary body. And we see this all the time in double stars. So the Berry Center is located in between the two uh, bodies. And this is the case of what we might really call Pluto is a double planet uh, and with this Berry-centric motion. All right, so it may be obvious that you can get the mass of Pluto from Kepler's third law. But maybe not obvious is that you can use the discovery of the satellite, the existence of the satellite, to map the surface of Pluto. And the reason for that is that Pluto is tipped over in its orbit. In fact, it's tipped over by 120 degrees. And that means that the satellite, which is in orbit around Pluto's equator, is more or less edge on. The satellite orbit is more or less edge on. And as the uh, motion around the sun carries the, sat the, the satellite um, along uh, the orbital motion of, around the sun, there are times when the orbit plane of the satellite is exactly edge-on. Pluto's orbit is 248 years, and that means you get these edge-on alignments once every 124 years. And it was really amazing that
that the discovery of the satellite happened right before we were about to get this edge on coincidence. So there were a lot of uncertainties as to when the orbit plane was going to tilt edge on because we didn't know the sizes of the bodies very well. We didn't know the orientation and the inclination of the orbit very well. And so we calculated that it would be sometime in the 1980s. So I went off to graduate school. There was a PI who had a grant to, uh, to uh, search for these transit events in the Pluto system. It required someone being at the telescope for about a week, a month, for year after year after year. I was the graduate student. You can guess who went to the telescope. And year after year, we went and searched and you know, analyzed where in the course of the 6.4 day orbit we should most likely see the transits. Nothing there. Published lots of papers on Pluto, but no transits. Finally, in 1985, we got the first transit events. Again, this is now familiar for anyone doing exoplanet work, but we were doing this this transit work, I think I'm going to abandon this. We were doing this transit work um, uh, uh, using planets, uh, planets and satellites, rather than exoplanets and getting these first events. And that was because the, the geometry was finally fixed. We were getting a portion of the satellite going in front of the disk of the planet. And as the uh, as Pluto carries the satellite plane along in its orbit, it goes more and more edge on. And so the impact parameter changes in terms of what parts of the disk of Pluto are getting scanned by the satellite. And all the while, the image is nothing, Pluto's image is nothing more than a fuzzy blob. We're not seeing Pluto and its surface and share on the satellite. All we're seeing is the total light from the system. And what we can deduce is that if the satellite is blocking part of the surface of Pluto and the light drops dramatically, it must be a really bright spot that's getting covered. And if the same area gets blocked on some other part of Pluto, but the light doesn't, overall light doesn't change very much, it must be a dark spot on Pluto. And so we use this to map the surface of Pluto. And there we are. This is our map from the 1980s. On, of uh, Pluto there on the cover of the Astronomical Journal. And you know, you get all happy when you get on the cover. You buy five cup copies for your mother and all sorts of things like that. Some people get the reference. And, uh, and then Cafe Press comes along and sells your cover image of Pluto on bumper stickers. And I've written to them, called them, and I'm still waiting for my royalty check to arrive. <laughs> all right, so great, we've mapped Pluto. Well, OK, we know something we didn't know. Great. But now you start ask, asking the next level of questions. We see bright poles. We see a dark equatorial band. We see, we see uh, sharp contrasts in albedo, bright spots next to dark spots. Something has to be doing this. Some, there has to be some process that's creating these features on Pluto. So we start asking questions, what's the process? So you take that basic knowledge and then start asking more detailed questions. One of the keys along the way was the discovery of what Pluto is made of, at least what's active on its surface, and that's frozen methane. So we are able to deduce, to deduce that the bright spots must be fresh frozen methane, the dark spots, older, uh, older deposits of frozen methane. So that's great, but why isn't it uniform? Why do we see this distribution? And we begin to ask questions like, well, something has to be able to transport these volatile elements like methane and nitrogen um, from one place to another. And to do that, you, have, you must have an atmosphere, or you must have something going on. And um, I'm going to say a few things about our late colleague, Professor Jim Elliott in EAPS. Jim was a pioneer in a technique known as stellar occultations, whereas if you can make a prediction with enough precision and calculate when Pluto would pass in front of a star, if you can figure out where on Earth that shadow is going to fall, you can watch the starlight change as it goes behind Pluto or another planet and deduce whether or not it has an atmosphere. And one of the key things you use is an airborne telescope. This is the Kuiper Airborne Observatory to get your telescope in the right place to see these occultation events. So this was the results from this 1988 occultation observed at many different stations. But what happened is Pluto went in front of this star. The starlight did not drop instantly, but in, instead faded gradually. And this was the discovery of an atmosphere of Pluto. And this was the thing that linked everything together. 
because now that we know that Pluto has an atmosphere, we must know that some of those volatile uh, species, like methane, nitrogen, um, must at some point sublimate, go into the atmosphere, freeze out at other locations, and that can give you, somehow give you this distribution that you see on Pluto. So it's very interesting when you look at a phase diagram for nitrogen and methane, and over the 40 to 80 Kelvin range, that's typical uh, temperatures at Pluto, you see that we go, nitrogen and um, methane, go from the solid phase to the gas phase. So we expect these to be very active elements interchanging between the surface and atmosphere on Pluto, very different than what we see on any other planetary body. So we also then ask the question, well, is the atmosphere constant or does it change? And we would think it ought to change because we know Pluto is an elongated elliptical orbit. And because Pluto's spin axis is flipped over, there are times when uh, the poles of Pluto are pointing directly at the sun. And there are times when Pluto's directly over, uh, the sun is directly over the equator. And it matters as to which part of the planet is getting its sunlight when it's closest to the sun. And so based on this, we think maybe the atmosphere of Pluto is changing. And in fact, ongoing stellar occultation measurements, mainly by the MIT group of Jim Elliott and his, his uh, cohorts of students and professionals now, all in red are the MIT contributions. Um, we see this change in Pluto's atmospheric pressure, even though Pluto is now past its closest point to the sun, past perihelion, the pressure still continues. And so one of the ideas is it's not just distance from the sun that matters, it really is the obliquity, the tilt. Where is the sunlight falling? Are we in Arctic summer, Arctic winter, things like that? And this is a model done by my graduate student, Alyssa Earle, that's trying to track uh, some of the processes that might be driving the atmospheric pressure on Pluto. All right, so not only does Pluto have a complicated orbit right now in the current 248-year sequ uh, sequence, but if you go back in time, the orbit nodes of the orbit are, are recessing. And if you go back about a million years, it turns out that the north pole of Pluto is facing the sun when it was closest. Right now, the sun's over the equator at perihelion. If you go back about 1.8 million years, we're back to this equinox situation. And if you go back about 2.4 million years, it turns out that the south pole was pointing at the sun when Pluto was closest. So these are all geologically interesting and important timescales. Even on interesting timescales up to about 20 million years, our colleagues Jack Wisdom and Jerry Sussman tell us that Pluto's orbit uh, solutions diverge on timescales greater than about 20 million years. So it gets really hard to understand what Pluto has been doing on these longer timescales. But it's, the point is there are a lot of different dynamical processes that are driving what we see on Pluto. And one of our challenges is try to decode the timescales of all these processes. All right. Here's what we knew in 1989. We knew Pluto had very interesting structure to its surface. We knew it had a very complex orbit, a changing atmosphere. We knew the basic sizes, basic physical parameters about Pluto. And we would reached the cap. To learn more about Pluto and understand these complicated things, unlike what we saw in other planetary bodies, we had to go there. And so um, there was a special session on Pluto at the American Geophysical Union meeting in Baltimore in 1989. The 12 Pluto scientists of the world were there. We gave talks to each other. <laughs> we went out to dinner. And we were talking, thinking about Voyager 2 was just about to reach Neptune. And that meant that the outer solar system was accessible to spacecraft. And we said, gosh, we're at this limit of Pluto. We should go there. Why not now? And why not us? And the best thing about this is we were basically all graduate students. And my advice to every student, if you want to explore the outer solar system, start young. <laughs> so we go to Pluto not because we've never been there before. And that's the key. It's not just because we haven't been there before. But there is this whole new type of planetary world that is just bizarre, different than anything we had thought about or seen before. And even more importantly, I think, and this is really a key discovery made by our uh, former MIT colleague, J uh, Dave Jewett, uh, MIT graduate, Jane Liu, and that's the discovery of the Kuiper Belt, the fact that Pluto is part of this new zone of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt. It's like an asteroid belt out beyond Neptune. It's even more populous than the asteroid belt 
as between Mars and Jupiter. And so the realization that if we wanted to explore this entirely new region of the solar system, we had to go there with Pluto as the archetype of uh, the, this uh, region of the Kuiper belt. So uh, all this was driving our thoughts and our motivation to try to go to Pluto. We had many iterations of different mission concepts. We would get funded by NASA to do a study and say, bring us your study and we'll fund your mission. Well, they find something they didn't like, and they said, bring us another one, bring us another one, et cetera. Six times we came and went with mission proposals, and you know the story. All right, so undaunted, we proceeded on in 2001. In fact, at this point, NASA held a competition and said, anyone who wants to bring forth a Pluto mission proposal can propose. And uh, we won that competition with New Horizons. Alan Stern was our principal investigator. And um, so we had won the, the right, again, to move forward with a, a mission study. And the thing that clinched it, that actually got the funding for the New Horizons mission was this process called the Decadal Survey Process. It operates in astrophysics, operates in planetary science, which is operated uh, by the National Academy. And it, it goes through a long process to try to rank the top priorities for exploration in space and in the solar system. And a Pluto Kuiper Belt mission was ranked as the number one priority in the 2003 Decadal Survey. And this is what finally secured us to fly to Pluto as part of a program at NASA called the New Frontiers Program. This is a $700 million mission, uh, which is sort of a medium class planetary mission. All right, so we got secure funding in 2003, and we had to hit the go button like crazy because we needed to make a launch window in 2006. The reason why we wanted to launch in 2006 is because Jupiter would be in the right location for a gravity assist to Pluto. Otherwise, it was 12 years later for Jupiter to be in the right place. And we wanted Jupiter in the right place by the, having the gravity assist shorten our total flight time by about three years. Three years is important because no spacecraft lives forever. And so the sooner you get there, the better your chance that everything operates on the spacecraft. And scientists are inherently selfish. We want to still be alive when the spacecraft gets there, too. <laughs> so uh, it was a, a long struggle to get to the launch pad in 2006, a big part of the story. Our goals were to char characterize the geology of Pluto and Charon, the composition of the atmospheres, and uh, understand the space environment. And at best resolution, we're getting about 70 meters per pixel. And so we could almost resolve MIT if it were sitting on Pluto. All right, these are the instruments on board the spacecraft, this long range imager giving us our highest resolution images, a radio experiment. We have to talk to the spacecraft. Particle and plasma detectors to look at the near space environment around Pluto, a dust counter built by students at the University of Colorado and a UV spectrometer called ALICE, and if ALICE is flying, Ralph has to go with ALICE, uh, though we're not going to the moon in this case. Um, this uh, Ralph is the imaging spectrometer that does all the compositional mapping. All right, so we're going to Pluto. It's uh, 30 AU away from the sun, too far away for solar, uh, solar power, solar panels to work. So how do you power a Pluto mission? Well, plutonium, of course. And I have an airport security story about this where a security officer asked me about the mission. And the only way to get on the airport airplane was to say plutonium. <laughs> we started out with about 300 watts of uh, power when we first fueled the, fueled the device. Uh, of course, that decays. The half-life is about 100 years. And uh, we had over 200 watts of power at the time we reached Pluto. It's scary when you do spaceflight when you think about what technology you're flying. And it turns out that the technology on New Horizons is the era of the Motorola flip phone. Ouch. <laughs> but what's key about this, it was, this was that revolution in miniaturization of electronics. And so we actually kind of hit this sweet spot in the mini miniaturization of electronics so that we're fly actually flying a very capable spacecraft in a small package. So, uh, we finally hit the right time where the technology, the capability, and the momentum for a mission all intersected. So we got to the point of assembling the spacecraft, testing the spacecraft. If you can break it on the ground, it's better than it breaking 
in space because it's hard to fix unless it's a space telescope and then Jeff Hoffman will come and rescue us. <laughs> you have to have engineers who build your rocket. And then you have to assemble it all. So this is the fairing or the upper part of the shroud of the upper shroud of the rocket. Here's the New, Hor New Horizons spacecraft. And to scale, you can see that the New Horizons spacecraft is this incredibly small piece in the whole giant rocket. And it actually makes sense in the following way. If you think about a rocket simply just delivering to you kinetic energy, what we want is velocity. We want to get there fast and then take it slow. And so uh, the velocity that you have is inversely proportional to the mass that you're trying to get there. So the lower we could keep the mass of the spacecraft, the higher velocity, the sooner we could get there in all the lifetimes that were relevant. And, uh, and it turns out if we were to uh, carry enough fuel so that we could stop and go into orbit at Pluto, the mass of that added fuel to do that stop and orbiting maneuver exceeds the launch capacity of any rocket available. So from the very beginning, this was always a flyby mission. All right, so we finally got to the launch pad and off the launch pad in January of 2006, nine and a half years ago. Uh, I told you we're putting a lot of energy into a small mass. We, were the, we still hold the record for the fastest departure from the Earth at 16 kilometers per second going past the moon's orbit in nine hours. Apollo is three days to the moon. We hit our gravity assist window at Jupiter. Uh, we, of course, we said we needed to test all our instruments, but of course we did lots of science at Jupiter uh, and uh, everything worked flawlessly. We then had a journey of 3,463 days, but who's counting? I was. <laughs> and you'd think that um, you know, we would, um, you know, we'd, uh, wouldn't have a lot to do. And it turns out we've been incredibly busy. Uh, even in 2015, We've had all these uh, different mission operations uh, broken down into very creative uh, names, like Approach Phase 1, followed by Approach Phase 2, followed by Approach Phase 3, and then the Near Encounter Phase, and then all our Departure Phases. So we have been very active collecting science data all of this calendar year. And in the meantime, we've, uh, we've also been trying to plan in great detail exactly what the, uh, the uh, in fact, like chore choreography, choreographing the exact flyby sequences when we're there. We were also very carefully looking at the Pluto system on the way in, because with Hubble Space Telescope, we were imaging, we were studying the Pluto system with deep imaging, looking to see if there were new satellites to be found or rings in the Pluto system because uh, we're flying through at about 20 kilometers per second, and even a grain of rice at 20 kilometers a second would destroy your spacecraft. So we were doing all this imaging, looking for new satellites. We didn't find any. Um, with New Horizons, uh, the Hubble imaging had discovered four small new satellites, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. And something really interesting about the satellite system, this is the ratio of their orbital periods to the orbital period of Charon. And all of them are very close, but not exactly integer multiples of the orbital period of Charon. And that's because dynamic planetary systems like to tend to evolve themselves into exact integer ratios. And uh, this system hasn't quite gotten there. So that's an interesting problem all on its own. Something uh, as New Horizons has been speeding towards Pluto, ground-based efforts have also been accelerating to try to, to basically make a link between what we see on the ground for Pluto and what we see in space. This is incredibly exciting, this new facility called ALMA, this array of radio telescopes in Chile in the Atacama de Desert coming online. This is a resolved image from the ALMA uh, radio telescope system provided by Mark Gerwell of Harvard, who's here. And um, anyway, this is uh, this Pluto system at the time of this image. And what's great about this is we now have a capability. New Horizons is a flyby through the system. But now we have this new capability of monitoring what Pluto is doing over very long-term seasons, including detections of molecules in the atmosphere like CO and HCN. So this is an incredibly exciting uh, new capability so that the fly, you know, what we learn now will be able to extend into the future. We have a whole host of things that we were, um, we've had ground-based astronomers contribute. 
And one of them has been, remember, this technique of stellar occultations. And wouldn't it be great if we could have a stellar occultation at the same time as New Horizons comes, comes by Pluto? Because we have decades of measurements of Pluto's atmosphere with this ground-based technique. And wouldn't it be great if we can link it to the in situ measurements by New Horizons? Well, this has been a fabulous MIT-led effort. Uh, Dr. Amanda Bosch was, and her team were able to predict with great precision where uh, a shadow of the shadow of a star uh, cast by Pluto would fall on the Earth. I mean, New Horizons got to Pluto on July, uh, July 14th. Here was nature providing an opportunity of a star on June 29th, just spectacular. So the prediction from Amanda Bosch was right on, right on target. Um, this is the new airborne telescope called SOFIA, and um, Dr. Mike Person is the PI on the SOFIA uh, observations. This is their flight path on June 29th with this last little loop in the flight path when Amanda Bosch radioed up this last correction and where they should position this, the, the airplane. So they did a little maneuver to get themselves at just the right spot at just the right time. And they, they absolutely nailed it because if you can get your occultation star centered exactly behind the disk of the planet, at, at that moment when it's centered, the light reflat, refracts evenly around the edge of the, the planet, like a gravitational lens only, really a refractive atmospheric lens. And you get this little blip, which is a central flash. So they absolutely nailed the occultation event. And this brought huge cheers from the New Horizons team when we heard the news that they were successful. All right, so finally, on board, New Horizons. Here we are on our way in. We don't, don't quite have Pluto and Charon resolved, but we're imaging them over you know, 6.4 day periods. And there is the barycentric motion of the Pluto-Charon system, just like 801 would tell you they ought to be. Here we are. We're finally resolving Pluto. And we're going to get closer and closer. This is how I spent my summer not having a vacation was just getting closer and closer to Pluto. So every day was a new, closer, better resolved image. So we're getting very close. We're just a few days away. And uh, just a quick comment on the geometry of how we see Pluto right now relative to what we were mapping back in the 1980s. And that is that Pluto is being tipped over again, now has the, uh, now has the sun more or less up by the North Pole. So we're only seeing the northern hemisphere of Pluto illuminated. We're missing sunlight in the southern hemisphere, whereas back in the 1980s, the sun was more than equinox right over the equator. But it turns out 3.2 days before we got to closest approach, we were at the exact geometry of the maps we had done back in the 1980s. In the 1980s, with this, these transit events, because the two bodies are synchronously locked to each other, the transits always occur over the same hemisphere. So you map only one hemisphere of Pluto with this technique. And this is the comparison when we line up the geometries between the 1980s and 2015. So it worked out OK. We had a good reason to go to Pluto. This is the geometry. Again, Pluto's tipped over. So the New Horizons spacecraft coming into the system is like hitting a bullseye pattern. And one of the things we wanted to do was to get into the shadow cones. This is the sun's shadow cone. Um, and go behind Pluto so we, and watch the sun set and the sun rise behind the edges of Pluto and map out the structure of the atmosphere. And do the same thing for Charon and look for traces of its atmosphere. All right, so I told you we were busy for the nine and a half years of flight getting there. This is a diagram that basically says, uh, as we go down in time towards closest approach, which instrument is switched on, which instrument is getting data, and, uh, uh, and how are they being stored and compressed and so forth. And in fact, this timeline, just for the last day of encounter, looks something like this. And so this is something that you work out entirely as a team, because everyone wants to measure everything all the time. You simply can't do it. You don't have the data storage. You, you have to pick and choose where you point. It is a flyby, after all. So this was an incredibly in, uh, int intricate process, but done with incredible uh, collegiality. And other missions have horror stories. We have none to, none, none to tell and none to share, uh, because we have none to tell. All right, I'm going to see if I'm, we're going to really find out if we can make a movie and PowerPoint work here in just a second. But what you're going to see is a little counter right here that tells you your time and distance 
to Pluto. And then up here in this corner is like the viewfinder for which instrument is getting its turn. And then in here, maybe if we can bring the lights down just a bit, see if we can bring the lights down just a bit. Here you can see the Pluto system and all the satellites and, um, and what instrument is doing what at Pluto. So let's see if the movie will work. It does. How about that? So here you can see the different instruments getting their turn um, the, between the satellites and the, the Pluto disk. So this is the choreography that we worked out over the course of the time of flight. Here you can see what's getting in the viewfinder. This is, of course, sped up, but it seemed like it went this fast. All right, we got images. We're sending them back to Earth. Now Pluto just went in front of the sun. We got the solar occultation. This is how it's supposed to work. And now Sharon's going to go in front of the sun and we get a solar occultation. All right, so this is how we planned it. We took a decade to get to the launch pad, nine and a half years of flight, four and a half hours of light travel time each way to the spacecraft. That's nine hours. We don't have time for the spacecraft to say, um, what should I do now? It all has to be autonomous. It's a flyby. We got one shot at it. And the only thing we could do, we knew that signal was on its way. And we had to wait that four and a half hours <laughs> as that signal was on its way to us. And all we could do is just buckle up and wait and wait and wait. And the signal arrived, and we did it. We felt the same way. <laughs> With us at the flyby were, were Ta Clyde Tombaugh's two children. Annette is pictured here. Annette and Al Tombaugh were with us at the flyby. And it was really special. All right, so it looks like Pluto made a little bit of news this summer. Um, the previous record on the NASA websites was the Mars landing in 2012, which knocked the NASA websites offline. And along comes the Pluto encounter, and we, <laughs> we knocked them offline again. All right, I put this picture of Alan Stern in here for a reason, and that is that the real credit, the unstoppable force, the single person, single most responsible person for making this happen has been Alan Stern. And he deserves all the credit in the world for bringing this mission to its success. All right, so finally, I'm gonna, and we might uh, take the lights down again, I'm going to give you a, 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 a tour through the system. Here's a family portrait where this, uh, the, uh, everything is to size scale on Pluto. And we'll start on the famous heart-shaped region on Pluto, which is called Tomba Regio, after the discoverer, of course. And I have to officially say that all these names are informal until improved by the International Astronomical Union. OK, I said it. <laughs> Within uh, Tomba Regio, there is this one region here that we call Sputnik Planum that is, it seems exceedingly flat and exceedingly fresh. And this is one of the great surprises of the mission. And so we're going to look at three different regions here on uh, Tomba Regio and just on the edges of Sputnik Planum and try to see what we've found. So this is at the top of Tomba Regio. And one of the jaw-dropping surprises here is th this vortex-like structure we see in the ice flow. And we see impediments in the ice flow and the vortices around it, as if we are seeing nitrogen ice glaciers five billion kilometers away from the sun. So we're, we've extended glaciology from the Earth to five billion kilometers away from the sun. What's interesting about this nitrogen ice flow, you say, well, what's going on here? As you go back to the phase diagram for nitrogen and you start thinking about, OK, what kind of pressures build up under tens of meters of nitrogen ice? And it turns out, under a few tens of meters of pressure, 
you, uh, of ice, tens of meters of ice, you build up enough pressure that you just start intersecting that liquid portion of the phase diagram. And so it may be that you get enough pressure underneath, you get a little bit of liquid nitrogen, which actually helps the process of these glaciers to flow. So it's just a fantastic uh, case of uh, seeing a physics applied in a new way in a new place. We see these structures in the ice fields. In there, we see similar things in Antarctica. We call them nunateks. The scientifically interesting and important thing about these is if we can make a guess of what the typical mountain heights are uh, in this region, then we can say, OK, how much, by how much are the, what we see sticking up above that? And can we estimate the thickness of that ice layer? So that's something we're actively doing. And another fantastic thing that we're seeing on Pluto, and this is a great example, is we see wind streaks. So we knew Pluto had an atmosphere. But now when we see wind streaks on the, on the surface of Pluto, we know the direction of the atmospheric flow. And this gives us constraints on building global circulation models for the atmosphere on Pluto. So the more wind streaks we see in the more places, the more constraints we have on our global circulation models. And we're absolutely thrilled about that. Here's something, and I don't know how well it quite shows up. Maybe it shows up a little better on the sides and the front. These things are these polygonal regions that look like convective cells in your oatmeal. And what we wonder is, is there enough internal heat to generate convective flow in these ice sheets? We're talking about only two to three milliwatts per square meter in terms of the uh, heat flow from the interior of, of Pluto. It's 50 to 100 times less than what we get on Earth. And, um, but we have to remember, we're dealing with volatile ices, and it doesn't take a lot of energy to re get them into their liquid state or their pliable state. And maybe we can actually see some of those flows. So this is a, just an active, ongoing question we have. Fantastically, we see these mountainous regions uh, on the southern part of, uh, of uh, Tomba Reggio. These are named after explorers, not presidential candidates. And of course, uh, Edmund Hillary and uh, Nor Norgay, the uh, uh, first ascent of Mount Everest. And I'm going to zoom in here on the Norgay Mount Montes. And just to illustrate a couple of things, the tallest peaks we see on the mountains of Pluto are about 3,000 meters. That's the scale of the Rocky Mountains. Smaller things here are on the scale of the Appalachians, about 1,000 meters. And we think we're starting to ask questions, well, what are the, what's make, constructing these mountains? And when we look at the strengths, the compressive strengths of things like water ice and nitrogen ice and methane ice, uh, nitrogen and methane are not strong enough to hold up features as high and as tall as these. And the only thing that has enough strength, like the strength of granite at 40 degrees Kelvin, is about the strength of water ice. Uh, that's what can hold these up. So we believe that these mountains are large water ice chunks there on the surface of Pluto. Tomba Reggio uh, is a particular uh, interesting region in terms of its composition. Globally, we see methane everywhere on Pluto, like we first saw with ground-based telescopes. But in this region, we see this amazing mix of methane ice, nitrogen ice, even CO, frozen carbon monoxide ice, in that region. This is a, an image uh, uh, of the sort of the methane mapping on Pluto. Again, just the color code tells you there's different particle sizes on Pluto. It just tells you there's lots of methane everywhere. The reason I want to show you this is because millions and millions and millions of people have already seen this. This is the most famous infrared spectrum in the history of science because when Pluto images were shown on Times Square, this infrared spectrum was shown on Times Square. So, you know, if you're a really geeky spectroscopist, you cheer. <laughs> All right, so why is Pluto red? We're used to Mars being red. Why is Pluto red? Well, uh, this comes back to the, the basic chemistry that we see in Pluto, mostly methane chemistry, that when methane molecules are exposed to ultraviolet radiation from the sun, they break apart. And as they reassemble themselves, they reassemble into longer and longer, more complex carbon chains, acetylene, ethylene, ethane. And generally speaking, as you go to longer and longer car carbon chains, you form this, these uh, um, materials that are called tholins. This is something that Carl Sagan was known for scientifically, his study of these organic compounds. And they tend to be very red. 
Something else about the tholins is that once they're formed, the more and more uh, ultraviolet radiation they receive, the darker and darker they get. So this leads us to think these darker regions on Pluto should be the oldest parts of the surface. And in fact, they're the most heavily cratered parts of the surface. And the way it works in planetary science is if you are a surface that just sits there for billions of years, you collect craters. And so you would expect the oldest regions of the surface to be the most heavily cratered. And that works for this example of matching the chemistry with the geology. And Tom Balregio, the brightest, freshest, crater-free region, uh, looks youngest in terms of its exposure to radiation and also exposure to the space environment of, of cratering. So that all hangs together. All right, moving on to Charon. Uh, we, uh, we knew that Charon was a water ice rich satellite because just like, like in exoplanet transits, you can take a spectrum of when you see the star and the planet sort of side by side. And then when the planet hides behind the star, you take another spectrum and you difference them. And we did this back in the 1980s when the satellite was uh, eclipsing or, uh, and transiting and being occulted behind the disk of the planet. So since the 1980s, we knew Pluto was a methane surface, rich surface. Charon was a water ice body. And we've seen water ice satellites elsewhere. Rhea is this heavily cratered old surface, just a, a body that's just sat there and just been collecting craters for four and a half billion years. And here's Ariel, a water ice satellite of Uranus, uh, which is relatively crater free, meaning that some geologic process has resurfaced and erased all the ancient craters and given it a younger surface. So most of us, myself included, were expecting this for Charon. And I, for one, was wrong. Uh, Charon looks more like Ariel, that somehow Charon has resurfaced itself. It has had some geologic activity to erase all the ancient craters and give it a younger, fresher surface. Uh, we don't yet have the age uh, figured out, but it's geologically young. What we also see as evidence of that activity on Charon is there's actually a, what looks like a tectonic ridge on Charon. So whatever the process has been to contort the body and, and reshape it, resurface it, it looks like we have a little bit of leftover tectonic evidence. One of the next steps is to look at the crater distribution on Charon. And we interestingly see crater-free regions and regions that are a little more heavily cratered, you know, older and younger surfaces sort of side by side. But what's fascinating about the craters is it tells us about the Kuiper belt. You can look at the craters and begin to understand what, it, what are the bodies out there in the Kuiper belt. That's one of the things we want to understand with this mission. And our own Helke Schlichting in Eeps has been doing different models for the formation and collisional processes that go on in the Kuiper belt to figure out what is the scale of impacting bodies and what kind of craters, crater uh, size frequency distribution should be occurring on the surface of Charon. And we're very preliminary. We need higher resolution data to really count the craters accurately. But at least initially, it looks like Helka's uh, estimates are, uh, are looking good at the moment, looking good. Something else that's surprised us about Charon is this red cap. It looks like this red material that's just sort of dusted onto the north polar cap of Charon. And it's really a mystery. And we think maybe these red, uh, this red material are the tholins, like we're seeing in Pluto, on Pluto's surface. They may have been tholins formed in the atmosphere of Pluto and then uh, escaped from the atmosphere of Pluto by the solar wind. I'll talk about that in a second and deposit it on Charon, but why they should preferentially deposit on the North Pole of Charon is something we don't understand. So uh, anyway, this is a complete surprise. We didn't see anything like that coming. I said there are four smaller satellites. Two of them we got close enough to just by happenstance. We were on our trajectory before these satellites were discovered. The two largest, Nix and Hydra, happened to be close enough to the spacecraft that we could resolve them. So these are the first resolved images of Nix and Hydra. More data are coming. Styx and Kerberos, the smallest satellites, are, were not particularly well positioned for high resolution imaging. So we're going to get a few pixels across on these guys, but not a lot. All right, so finally we have this amazing image, the dark side of Pluto. An out of this world image. I love this image. We're on the back side of Pluto looking back towards the sun. 
And in that image, of course, is science. You can see structure and haze structure in Pluto's atmosphere. So absolutely astounding as to what it is that's driving that atmospheric structure. And remember I said we wanted to hit these aim points and get into the shadow cones of Pluto and Charon. We, got, we traveled 5 billion kilometers, and we nailed the aim points to within about 100 kilometers. Pretty good odds. And here we see the sun setting behind Pluto. You see the gradual dimming, hitting a haze layer, and then dropping, and then rising sunrise behind Pluto. So there's the highest level detail we've ever had on Pluto's uh, atmospheric structure. And on Charon, the light just drops immediately and rises immediately, showing that Charon itself does not have an atmosphere. And when we do the calculations, we think that Charon just lacks the gravity to hold on to atmospheric molecules. And so Pluto gets to hold on to the atmosphere. It's bigger, but Charon does not. All right, we continue flying down the plasma tail. This is the solar wind blowing on the, the system, knocking uh, um, atoms out of the atmosphere, ionizing things like nitrogen. Nitrogen, as it turns out, is very hard to detect because the nitrogen is clear just like the air and nitrogen in this room doesn't absorb much light, if any light at all. And so, but it turns out we can detect nitrogen by its disassociation into ions, and that's all downstream in the plasma tail of Pluto, which we're actively still measuring as we fly. All right, so coming attractions. The images I've shown you are, the, are in this red region, and uh, the zoom ins we did were in this region. And these are at resolutions between about 0.4 and 2 kilometers per pixel. And um, we, are, we have a data rate of 1,000 kilobits per second. Remember your telephone, you stick it into the acoustic coupler. All right, now imagine downloading the HD movie that way, and it's going to take us a year. All right, but we have coming in this region uh, res high resolution images of about 0.9 kilometers per pixel. We have in this region about 400 meters per pixel resolution. And finally, in this other last strip, is our 70 meter per pixel resolution images of the Pluto surface. So they're all coming down on the longest, slowest HD download in history. Out beyond Pluto, we have finally found a target in the Kuiper Belt. We have a certain amount of fuel on board, so the challenge was to find an object. We know there are lots of objects in the Kuiper Belt, but it's not infinitely dense. It's not Star Wars asteroid belt. It's, there's really millions of kilometers separation between these things. It makes bad Hollywood movies, but it's reality. So we uh, put forth an enormous effort with the Magellan Telescope in Chile, and great thanks to the Magellan Telescope Committee, Paul Schechter, who was very supportive in our efforts to give us enough time to do very deep searches for a Kuiper Belt object on our trajectory to Pluto. Ultimately, we, requ we required Hubble to finish the job, so thank you to Jeff for fixing Hubble. And we found a target which we creatively named Pl Potential Target 1. We found uh, several of them, uh, but this turns out to be the best one. It turns out to be one that is, requires the least amount of fuel, and we are now authorized to start navigating the spacecraft towards PT-1, and we're doing that with a series of long, slow turns, basically slow maneuvers, uh, which is most fuel efficient rather than making a hard turn to starboard uh, a few years down downstream. So we will go past this object in January 2019. We need NASA approval and funding to uh, look at that object then, but um, uh, we simply we have to make go through the proposal process. We're optimistic, but we don't know until we do the, do the process. Here is the size of PT-1, about 50 kilometers across, compared to the really interesting target body, um, C, Comet CG, that is uh, where the Rosetta mission to Pluto, uh, to European Rosetta mission has gone to Comet CG. All right, so I started off by saying it takes a team. And something interesting happened with New Horizons is that about 25% of the team are women. And this just happened. It's just how you, know, you just hire the best people. And um, but the media made a big deal of this, because this is leaps and bounds more gender balance, uh, or towards gender balance, than any previous NASA mission. So we're very proud that we've made some advance here. It's not where we want to ultimately be, but we're, we, it seems we've made a big leap in NASA missions with New Horizons. MIT has a huge role here in New Horizons. These are MIT faculty, MIT graduates. 
um, the, involved in the New Horizon mission. You might recognize Dava Newman, who's now the NASA Deputy Administration, Administrator. And Larry Young has had a very important role here, too, as I'll say in a minute. In fact, Larry Young's role was Leslie. Um, Leslie Young and Kathy Olkin are two EAPS PhD students of Jim Elliott, and they rose to the ranks of being deputy project scientists on the New Horizons mission, having some of the two most important key roles in really making this mission a success. And so these were Jim Elliott's students, and uh, it's a great tribute to Jim Elliott, not only for his science contributions, but also his mentoring contributions to the success of New Horizons mission. And because of that, one of the most prominent features on Pluto is now proposed as Elliott Crater. So there's a piece of MIT real estate on Pluto. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion, when I step back and really think about this, I th and think about it in a historical perspective, I think it's absolutely astounding that just two centuries ago, the frontier of exploration was voyaging across the continent. That was the Lewis and Clark expedition. And 200 years later, that frontier of exploration is now across the solar system. And I think that's absolutely amazing. And I think that may be part of what it is that uh, you know, got all the attention this summer. But another piece of it is, in the last 50 years, it's our generation over the last 50 years that has completed the first reconnaissance of the solar system. And it's really a privilege and amazing to be part of that. And if we have one lasting hope about the impact of New Horizons is that we hope that this encounter becomes the Apollo moment for a new generation. And I think we'll find out for sure if this is the case when we interview the class of 2030. <laughs> so in closing, I said it takes a team. And on behalf of the team, thank you all. Okay, so the question is, what delta V would we need to put it in orbit? So we're at 20 kilometers per second, so we need almost 20 kilometers per second in delta V. Uh, the the um, orbital velocity for Pluto is, is low. It's of order a kilometer per second. So we would have had to, to effectively lose all that. So it's simply beyond the capacity to carry the fuel to do it. Yeah, up here. Was any thought given to uh, sending a second probe oh. Oh, yes. The question is, was there any thought of having two probes 3.2 days apart? That was one of those iterations there. I wanted to call them Lewis and Clark. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have that. Uh, you know, you can build two spacecraft for less than the price of two, you know, one and a half or something like that. So there was an economy of scale. But that went by the, the wayside. But yeah, we would love to have spaced a couple of them apart. I, if it were me, I would have spaced them 10 years apart or something like that. And, you know, because now we're interested in what's the time scale and all these features, these structures we see. Uh, I think that's really the overwhelming uh, question we have now. What's the time? See all this activity, all this stuff going on. Does it happen on century time scales, decadal time scales, even daily time scales? We don't have a clue. Yeah. Say it again. When do kids get to go to Pluto? When you design the mission to get there. <laughs> Start now. What came first, Pluto the dog or Pluto? Oh, what came first, Pluto the dog? Actually, Pluto the planet became, came before Pluto the dog. So we are more famous than the dog. <laughs> great. Was there a question here, Mike? Surprised that nothing hit the space 
Oh, yeah, so were we surprised nothing hit the spacecraft? Well, the calculations when we you know, think about the particle density, uh, we were 99 point something confident that we would sail through, but not, you know, the chances weren't zero. So I don't think we were surprised, but we were relieved. <laughs> so that's what made the signal receipt the, 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 the nail biter in the sense. We had all confidence in the performance of the spacecraft. Uh, but there was just that last element of, and, and what you do in these things is you say, what have we forgotten? What thing we wish have we not thought of that we were going to say, oh, we wish we had thought of that. And that's the hardest part, is trying to rethink everything and, and try to come up with what you've forgotten or what you've overlooked. And that's the hardest part of the, of the process. Yes? So how much faster is New Horizons going to the Voyagers? Voyagers are actually going faster because they got, mul especially Voyager 2, because they got multiple gravity assists uh, from each planet as they went by. So Voyager 2 holds the speed record uh, in terms of leaving the solar system. So we are on the way. We'll go by our Kuiper Belt object. And ultimately, New Horizons and a little bit of Clyde will leave the solar system and go out into interstellar space. Yeah. What's been the most touching? Um, uh, two things. One is the look, seeing the joy on my colleagues' faces who put so much time and effort into this. And related to that is watching our students shine, seeing our graduates who are in these key roles and knowing all the effort that they put into this and made it work. And there's no greater professional satisfaction as a, you know, as a professor than seeing your students shine. And that came through in abundance in this mission. So that was really the, the satisfying part. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes, up here. So you mentioned that the spacecraft was designed in 2001, so just a few years ago. How would the spacecraft instruments be different? Oh, OK. So if, we could, if we're building New Horizons today, how would they be different? Uh, the short answer is we'd pretty much fly the same thing, because you know, the instruments were all tuned to what we understood about Pluto. Um, you know, so we could be a little better, a better, set, a better sensitivity, lighter, more memory capacity, things like that. So I think we mainly have just more uh, memory capacity on board. Um, you know, we'd love to have a magnetometer and all sorts of things, but that adds a lot of complexity to get those things on, onto the spacecraft. Um, I think overall we wish we could go there and stay, but, but, but stay there for decade old time scales. Really go, you know, I'd love to go back in 10 years or 20 years. And uh, one of our younger members will start doing that. Um, let's see how things change on these decadal timescales. We know they, there's a lot of stuff going on, and, and that timescales are the really interesting part of the question now. <coughs> Up here? All right, so with the right funding, how many objects can we go to? We know of one. Right now, we have one and only one that we've identified. In the surveys we've done with Magellan and Hubble, um, don't readily ad identify a second target beyond the first. So we're putting our eggs in the basket of PT-1. We want to make sure that this one uh, we pull off with great success. And uh, so now that we know what trajectory we're, we're on, we could uh, focus some, some additional surveys towards a follow-on target. But right now, it looks just like one. And if there were another one, we maybe would have seen it by now, too, because we were, of course, looking for that as well. So. So um, the Kuiper Belt is just a little less dense than we had thought or maybe had hoped. Yeah? So what are the main science we hope to learn about Pluto? Uh, one is just to see how the physics works. How, did the, how does nature organize itself with these volatile species at 40 Kelvin, which is a regime that's so totally different than what we have here on the Earth? So I think it's really just seeing how does nature operate in a completely different place than anywhere we've ever explored before. Up here. Oh, human colonization. I think we have to accomplish Mars first. Um, I'm not sure. You know, Mar uh, Pluto's not not the kind of place to raise your kids because it's cold as hell. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. We'd have to have a motivation why we wanted to do it. Uh, so you know, is, is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. Um, but I think that's pretty far downstream. Yeah? I think this was on a slide earlier, but what was the temperature range on Pluto? Temperature range on Pluto is between 40 and 80 Kelvin, which is about minus 400 Fahrenheit. 
So think about that this winter. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, Ganymede. So Ganymede, uh, the question is about Ganymede uh, magnetic field. Ganymede is a large satellite of Jupiter. Um, Jupiter, in the Jupiter environment, you have a lot of tidal stresses, among other things, which can generate um, uh, a little bit of more internal heat and uh, even get to the point of liquid water. We think that might be the case under the surface of Europa, one of Jupiter's satellites. Um, we think that maybe if you have a uh, conducting liquid inside Ganymede and it's actually flowing, that can generate a magnetic field. Did you say anything about Pluto and No, we, have, we did not carry a magnetometer. That requires a particular clean spacecraft. Magnetometers are hard to fly because you don't want to just detect the spacecraft when you get there. And so in terms of keeping the mission on, basically on time and on budget, we didn't fly a magnetometer. But, you know, basically we're seeing flows and things, uh, you know, there may be flowing things at Pluto. Uh, so in a follow-on mission, maybe I'll go, to go into Anton's question. Uh, yeah, if I were flying again, I'd fly a magnetometer and really try to understand that. So we get more. I'd like to have more information on the internal structure. Maybe it's a good time to thank Rick again. Thank you. Uh, for an inspiring talk. Thank you.